So we are going to have a 30-minute conversation um, today. I am with Anja Sanders. Uh, we had the pleasure of talking last week. A mutual friend of ours introduced us virtually uh, via Facebook, because that's the way we all meet each other now in a virtual world at this moment. So uh, I'm so glad to be able to see you finally and <laughs> just have a, a talk. Um, we have on the Zoom today as well, uh, Priscilla Cisneros is going to be acting as our co-host. So if there's photos that we're going to share, she's going to help me do that as well. Um, Anja, we're going to have a 30-minute conversation, but I want us to start with a little bit of the conversation that we had last week. Um, you were born in Marshall, Texas. What was, what was that like, living in Marshall? Um, it was pretty idyllic. I was an only child for 15 and a half years. My parents were educators. Um, grew up in a middle class family. Um, had four loving grandparents. No siblings. I always wanted a sister. Um, I thought everything was fine until I was about 10 or 11 years old and my parents, who both graduated from Bishop College, took me downtown because there was a downtown and there's still a downtown with the old courthouse square. They took me downtown to watch a little upheaval, which was the students from Bishop and Wiley Colleges, two HBCUs in Marshall, that were picketing the Woolworth lunch counter, which was segregated. That was my first awakening to, oh my God, there's inequality. <laughs> yeah. so, but, you know, I had a, uh, when I was in eighth grade, my parents bought um, 52 acres outside the city limits. So I'm a country girl through and through. Um, country girl lost in the big city and had a grand old time. Yeah. I went through a completely segregated school system mm -hmm. from second grade because I skipped first grade uh, from second grade through high school. And what year and was somewhere this? somewhere along there, my parents had another baby, so I had one sibling. <laughs> what, year were, what year are we talking about? That I graduated? Mm -hmm. 1966. Okay, so you graduate, oh, time. <laughs> you graduate in 1966, and you decide to go to SMU. How did that happen? Right. <laughs> I had actually been accepted at the University of Texas in Austin. Mm -hmm. But, you know, 66 was right in the height of the civil rights movement. And UT at that time did not allow black students to live in the dormitories. They lived in co-ops, which were less secure. Um, remember, I told you I was an only child for 15 years, 15 and a half mm -hmm. years. And my parents were very protective. You know, I was their one little egg that they guarded with mm -hmm. their lives. And so they wanted me to be able to live in a dorm situation. Well, I went for my physical and my doctor was talking to me about where I was going to college. And, you know, we, we told him all of this and my mother was there, mm -hmm. expressed her concerns. And he said, have you ever thought about SMU? Which was actually um, much closer to Marshall, which was mm -hmm. a, a bonus for my parents. You know, they could get to me in case whatever they had in their minds happened. Um, and so I applied and I was accepted. So it really was just happenstance. There, I, was, I hadn't tracked SMU for years or anything. There was just serendipity, really. Mm -hmm. So you, you get into SMU. So glad I did. And, you, and it's the late 1960s. Um, what was that experience like walking onto the SMU campus? You were one of a handful of students. Uh, I was to, you were one of a handful of black students to really be on the campus at the time. Was that correct? I was one of 10 black students on a campus of 10,000 people who looked nothing like me. So I went from one segregated school system to basically another segregated school system. Um, it was interesting. Um, the first thing that happened to me the week before classes started, one, and at this time the, the dorms were segregated by gender. One mm -hmm. of the boys' dorms came over to take the girls' dorm that I lived in on a picnic. Well, my roommate, who was black, because if you were a black student at SMU, you either had a black roommate or no roommate. 
um, they came over to take us on a picnic where my roommate had a boyfriend there at college, so she didn't go. So here I go across campus with um, several dozen white kids and nobody else black. And we walked to a park. I had never been there before, didn't really know where I was. And what ended up happening was I ended up sitting on the grass all alone for about two hours because nobody said a word to me. Nobody mm -hmm. said, hi, how are you doing or anything. It was the most humiliating experience of my life to this very day. Um, that was the day I have told people I became black at SMU because that was the day that I realized that although I thought I was just like everybody else, not everybody looked at me like that. Mm -hmm. So it was very, very hurtful. But I dealt with it because what else can you do? Mm -hmm. um, the next blow that came was one day, I, you know, I'm 17 years old, a newly minted 17-year-old fresh out of a small town. And I'm just walking calmly toward class and I come upon this two-story tall Confederate flag which was hung from the top, from the roof of a building that turned out to be the Kappa Alpha Fraternity House. And that was in the midst of Old South Week uh, that they celebrated every year. They would basically take over the school. Um, they'd have, they would dress up as Confederate soldiers. On occasion, they would have a symbolic slave auction. They would symbolically secede from the university, make speeches, etc. And um, that was it. That was my initiation into um, that life was a little bit different at SMU. I didn't have any problem with classes or teachers, but those were two eye-opening experiences. Yeah. What was it like to, to tell your parents that? What did they think about what was happening to you? <laughs> were they worried? I never told my parents about the picnic. I may have told them years later about the flag. Um, they would have probably been worried had I told them that, but mm -hmm. I just thought this is where you are, this is what you have to deal with, so you deal with it. Yes. So I'm, I'm going to try to share here, and I might have Priscilla help me with this. You sent us a photo of you in 1969 and which you right. issued some demands. So Priscilla is going to be sharing. We're sharing this photo right now. This is you in 1969. Um, oh yeah. And you issued demands. And tell us what tell us what, what were they, and who did you do, issue them to? Well, it wasn't just me. There were 33 black students on campus at that time, and we, um, as an we had formed an organization, BLAACS, Black League of Afro American College Students. Mm -hmm. And we issued the demands. We took over the president's office. We had a sit-in. Um, we occupied it in current day parlance. Mm -hmm. um, the demands were, there were 13 of them. I don't remember all 13. Um, we demanded um, more recruitment of black students, non-athletes in particular. We asked for 500. We did this in April of 1969, and we wanted 500 black students by the fall semester. Mm -hmm. um, since I've now found out how recruitment goes, that was a little unrealistic, but, you know, shoot for the moon, right? Um, <laughs> <laughs> we wanted that. Um, we wanted um, some black professors. There were none. We wanted some African-American studies program or classes, a curriculum is actually what we wanted. There was no such thing at that campus, mm -hmm. no black studies, no black history, no black professors. We wanted, and it wasn't all about us. We um, had at SMU at the time, maids that worked in the dormitories. And there were these middle-aged black women that would come into your dorm and they would clean the dorms. If they liked mm -hmm. you, they would make up your bed. They liked <laughs> me, so sometimes they would make up my bed. Um, but they would clean the dorms. All of the workers in the cafeteria were black women. Uh, there were a couple of black men who worked uh, in maintenance in the student center um, and the bowling alley. And so I found out we had to use a lot of strategy and subterfuge 
in, in talking to these workers because they really were not supposed to talk to us. Um, mm -hmm. So I would get these phone calls while we were working up toward our demands. I would get these phone calls late at night um, because at SMU, every room had a phone. Um, mm -hmm. And they would whisper, they don't want us to talk to you all. But I found out that those maids, made, they took home $85 every two weeks. These are people who have families. $85 every two weeks, even in 1969 dollars, that is a pittance. Their children couldn't go to school on a discounted rate like other SMU employees could. So we included them in, in our demands. We wanted some uh, black staff in managerial um, positions. We wanted them to get a pay raise. Um, so we had to take care of, you know, not only ourselves, but them and future generations. We also asked them for a place of our own because their SMU is heavily Greek. Um, and you know, all the Greek organizations, there were no black Greek organizations, of course. Um, they all had a place to go. They all had a house. We asked for a house. So yeah. those were some of the things that we requested. Yeah, so we're also sharing another photo of you um, with it looks like uh, students still at SMU as well. You have. I see Warren, you <laughs> you Warren, did I see Warren on yes. the left. Warren C. Right. Yes. So this was you, a few years ago. Yeah. So you didn't stop when you left SMU. When you graduated, you you stayed active on in the community there. Why, why do you think that was important? And it's, it's important now because, you know, SMU students right now have an ongoing hashtag called Black at SMU in which they're sharing their experiences while being on the campus. And it's hard to read them because they are, they are hurtful. And it didn't stop to see some of the, you know, blatant racism that some of them have still faced. Um, the lack of diversity in the classroom in, among professors, you know, that's, why was it important to you to stay connected to the community at SMU, even in as, as an alumni? Well, I, let me be perfectly honest. I did not stay connected. I reconnected after a number of years um, because when I left SMU, my attitude was, I don't ever want to see you again. Um, I was done. <laughs> I was done with SMU, but at, then five years later, I went back and got my master's degree, but then I was still done again. I got it, and then I walked away, but then there was just some little voice nagging me in the back of my mind that there are students out there now who may be in need of a surrogate, surrogate aunt or grandmother. You know, they just may need to look at an adult who looks like them. Maybe I can bake some cookies and take to them something, you know, so that you don't feel so isolated and alone. And so um, I went back, I, I made connections um, with people out there, and I was invited to speak. And when I did, I found out that none of the current crop of students had ever heard of anything that we did. They hadn't heard of our organization. They hadn't heard of the sit-in. They hadn't heard about any of the history. They were stunned um, to hear that. But they were grateful because they found out that they were not alone. They were not walking a path that had not been walked before. Um, and so I reached back out to SMU, not necessarily for the university itself, but for the black students who were there to let them know, we've been here before, you know? You didn't invent this struggle. We have been here before. We dealt with it. We dealt with it with you in mind because we knew we wouldn't be the last class to come through there. Mm -hmm. And so um, I really enjoy interacting with them. There are some of the professors who, the white professors who invite me out to address student groups. Um, during this current situation, 
I have served on the alumni board and I've served on the black alumni board and it was two completely different organizations. Um, during the current situation, uh, racial and political situation, um, a week before last, I guess it was, I was asked by um, the black alumni board to write a letter to ABS, which that's the, the grandchild of the organization that we started, Blacks. ABS is Association of Black Students. And I was asked to write a letter addressing them and their concerns. And I said, yes, I'll do it, but only if um, a young man, Demarcus Allen, would join me in writing it because in 2015, he was the president of ABS and that group too had presented a list of demands. And so we jointly wrote a letter to the students um, which has actually been disseminated to the entire SMU community. So I think, it's, I think it's good for them to know that they have a touchstone. I, in the letter I quoted um, the Christian Bible, Ezekiel, who went among the exiles and, he, and the Bible says he sat where they sat. And I told them, we sat where you sit. And when you sit where someone sits, then you see what they see. We see what you see. We persevered, and you will too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I'm looking forward to reading the letter. Um, I would love to see that. I think it's so important that students, all students, be aware, may, be made aware of the history of the previous student movements before them. I went to Baylor. Some of what I read on the SMU thread is not it. It mirrors what I believe has happened at Baylor and what I saw even in the 2000s. Um, so I'm hoping that students across the country are able to reconnect to see that you are not alone in this. This is not the first time um, students have stood up and here is a way to do it. I mean, really, a lot of the times it's not totally reinventing the wheel. It's looking at the documentation and the requests that were made before. Have they done them? Right. Why didn't they? Right. And that's that, uh, you know, I, I want to commend you for that. I appreciate that so much because being able to look at the history of your own school is just as important as what's happening. So I'm going to transition a little bit to another program that you are involved in, and I'm going to have Ian step in and help me a bit too. This is um, Feed Oak Cliff. Talk to me about uh, what is the mission of your organization there? What is the purpose of your organization? Um, I started this organization in, with one goal in mind, which is to attack the food deserts or end the food deserts in the southern sector of Dallas, Texas. Um, it grew out of a personal realization and frustration of mine. I've lived in Oak Cliff since 1980, and when I, when I moved over here by my house, it was a vibrant, thriving, beautiful neighborhood with grocery stores and nice restaurants. There was a mall, West Cliff Mall. Um, over the years, while my back was turned dealing with my career and my marriage, you know, my husband, rest in peace, um, while I wasn't looking, the area started to change and the grocery stores went away. So I used to do my grocery shopping on McKinney Avenue, um, which is 12 miles. It was an Albertsons at McKinney and Lemon. It's 12 miles from my home. And one day I realized they had a, a salad bar right inside the front door. And one day I realized that there's absolutely nothing comparable in Oak Cliff. And that struck me as odd and disturbing. And so um, that resulted in, after having a community meeting, resulted in me starting an organization called Feed Oak Cliff. We have been trying for um, about five years to recruit mainstream grocery stores. We get rebuffed. We've been rebuffed with all kinds of nonsensical answers, if they even reply at all. And so now we are engaged in um, looking at the feasibility of building our own grocery store, community-based grocery store, because Oak Cliff has a perception problem, a misperception problem. Um, people who have probably never been here, or if they have, they've only been to Bishop Arts um, and have never ventured into the other 90% of Oak Cliff, think that it is a high crime, low income area. I'm in a middle to upper middle income um, neighborhood. It's very quiet, it's low crime. Our houses look exactly like same style, mid-century modern as uh, Lakewood. 
and our crime is lower. But you don't hear that. So we have to combat those misperceptions. Um, one way we do that is by an annual event, a free event called the Dallas Veg Fest, which is uh, a free festival of nutrition, health, and environment held at beautiful Keast Park. Um, it's to let everybody know that, no, we don't eat our young. We do eat more than fried chicken, and we do want access to healthy food. Stuff. So that's what I'm doing now. That's what Feed Oak Cliff is all about. Mm -hmm. What does it mean when you don't have access to healthy food, when you don't have a grocery store that has fresh produce and you might have to drive 12 miles to the nearest one? What does that really look like in a community? Drive 12 miles if you have a car. What if you don't have a car? If, um, mm -hmm. What it means is that your life expectancy, your quality of life and your life expectancy is severely impacted. Um, if you start with a young woman who is pregnant and she can't get access to quality food and healthy, fresh produce, then her prenatal care is not what it should be. And the child growing inside her does not come into the world as healthy as it could be. You come in with disadvantages. Um, children's brains in their very, very early formative years are greatly impacted by what they have access to food-wise. And if you don't eat well, it makes it harder to comprehend. You know, some children are even hungry. <clears throat> Excuse me. So not only do they not have the right food, they don't even have enough food. Um, it's harder to keep up in school. You don't do as well. You're more likely to drop out of school. That means you will never get uh, a decent job. That means if you are in a neighborhood that is not what it should be and is more dangerous or downtrodden, um, you can't move out of it. And your life might be impacted, really, by a drive-by bullet. But even if not, you are subject to more health conditions. The um, Dallas County Health and Human Services and Parkland Hospital do every couple of years, a community needs health assessment. And it lists the communities, and they're all in the southern sector, that have higher rates of obesity, diabetes, heart disease, and cancer. And all or most of these can be directly impacted by what you have access to. D Magazine did an article that said that there's a zip code, 75215, and another zip code I don't know if it's 204. I'm not sure what the other one is, but it's in the northern part of the city. If you live in 75215, your life expectancy is 26 years lower than a zip code just a few miles away. And it's because of what you have access to, to eat. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's literally life-changing, life-threatening. Yes. To not have... Uh so right now we're in a pandemic, um, making grocery stores come to the area is going to be even harder. Um, is there, are there things that you're thinking of now? I think a lot of us are thinking of different ways to, to look at our food, even if you have grocery store access and easily grocery store access, it's not always, I mean, in the early part of the pandemic, it's really difficult to find fresh vegetables, certain kinds, even on the shelf. So we were, my family was looking at trucks that were driving around and just stop, trucks would stop in empty restaurant parking lots, open the back of it up, and you just pulled up and bought a box of groceries. That was it, a box of produce. And if, they, if you were lucky, they would toss it into rolls of toilet paper. That's how they were functioning. Um, are you all looking at that and saying, you know, do we have to have a standing store as opposed to movable markets or, um, you know, community, uh, an escalated community garden, or maybe using restaurants to have fresh produce stands outside of it? There, that's a great question. Uh, fortunately, there are a lot of moving pieces to this, and there are a lot of people who have um, become involved in it. So um, there's a family that's a part of Feed Oak Cliff um, that started something called the Oak Cliff Veggie Project. And every month before the pandemic, 
um, they were giving out, and it's completely free. You, it's donation-based if you want to give a donation or you're able to find. If not, that's okay. They're giving away free, fresh produce. Now, during the pandemic, they have increased that to weekly giveaways. But in addition to that, they have um, a community garden, and they are helping other people start community gardens. University of North Texas has been working in, in Southern Dallas, uh, in Oak Cliff, has been working with Toyota uh, to develop a, a mobile food truck. Um, obviously, you know, food banks have been around a long time, but that's a different thing that you don't get so much produce, I don't think, there. It's, it's canned goods, but if you're hungry, yeah. whatever. Um, so I applaud them. But there are, there are people who are, um, making their own backyard gardens. There's, um, you know, aquaponics or hydroponic towers, grow towers, where people can grow something inside their home or on the patio. Um, so there are a lot of eyes on this issue now, fortunately. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm, and I'm glad for that. Um, you know, we're getting close to the end of time, but, you know, it's so interesting when we were talking, we talked about you you're growing up in Marshall and you're going, and of course you're telling us about going to the Woolworths counter. Do you expect that your life would lead you to a place where you would be doing this kind of leadership, this kind of, you know, outspokenness and, and fighting for injustices, whether it's on campuses or for workers on a campus or for food access? Did you think that in Marshall, Texas, you'd be doing this now and still doing this, and still doing this. Never, never, ever, ever would have crossed my mind. Um, no, but, you know, I have to wonder exactly how much does DNA transfer? Because after the sit-in at SMU, which, by the way, I did not tell my parents I was doing that, um, <laughs> they found out the superintendent of the school went to my mother's classroom and said to her, Miss Sanders, doesn't your daughter go to SMU? Yes, she does. Is she involved in this mess at SMU? And she said, I'm sure she is. <laughs> after I went home after that, I found out something that I never knew before, which was that my dad was involved in the Sweat V Painter case that integrated the University of Texas graduate schools, law and medical school, when he was in college, I never heard that before. Mm -hmm. um, my grandfather in the 1930s, when my mother was a little girl, went to uh, vote in Quitman, Texas, a tiny, tiny, a tiny town. I actually have an article published about that. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I'm thinking, is this kind of stuff hereditary? <laughs> Or did, did you just pick it up in the vibes inside the house? Um, my opinion is you have to fight injustice wherever you find it. Somebody has to do it. I know I'm not a hero. I'm an introvert. But I have been pulled outside of my house by my passion for this cause. And there are a lot of people who are walking the same road. Um, we're going to get there. But no, it's nothing I would have, I would have laughed at you and said you were crazy if anybody had ever told me anything like this. So and yet here really, I am. God has a sense of humor. I have a quick question, if it's yeah, all right. Yeah. Yes. Um, hello. Um, so since Hi. this has been a great discussion, that's why I've just been sitting quietly because I'm just absorbing it. Um, but we are in a discussion with, with someone who's been fighting these issues for several decades now. Uh, she's got a very comprehensive perspective on the local level, um, and the host is a candidate for elected office. Um, so I'm wondering, what would you uh, demand of elected officials? What can they do? You know, it's going to take more than, than electoral politics to combat these issues, but they're still a, a crucial part. What would you demand of elected officials um, that's my question. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's a good question. Great question. That's a good question. Uh, back to a list of demands, right? Um, I would demand that they stay in touch with the community. 
not just coming up to an election, but after the election, when you're in office and you have the power to access uh, the resources that are needed, that when you're in the corridors of power, then you wield um, an ability that most people in the community don't have. Listen to all of the voices. Be on the ground and look and don't relegate yourself to going to the fancy dress balls and the cocktail, cocktail parties. Get in here, find out what's going on in the community. Talk to everybody. Talk to the guys on the street. You know, talk to the neighborhood associations. Find out what's really going and what is really needed. And then put your shoulder to the wheel and work for it. And then we'll keep sending you back to office. <laughs> I like those demands. I think those are things that I, I agree with fully and I want to be able to, to do as well. Um, I'm going to wrap us up and I want you to know that we have recorded this so we will share with you the recording. Um, we will do a little bit of editing just for the sound quality if there's any issue there. We can't always tell until after it's done but feel free to share it. I've enjoyed our conversation. I hope that uh, we stay in touch. Um, I want to know what you're doing in the community. Um, I want to look at this as, as, and be able to, like you said, when you're talking to the community and seeing what the needs are. Sometimes the needs in one community are the same in another, but they have done the work or they're further ahead in the process. And it's important to me to be able to say, well, have you looked at this program or have you heard about what they're doing over here? Because it, you're not, sometimes when you're trying to make change, you're not the first one to do it. There are examples ahead of you that you may not even be aware of. And I'm so glad that you shared with us your um, demands to SMU. It was amazing to see that photo that you sent me sitting inside the president's uh, suite or his office. Um, and to know that in 1969, yeah, you were doing that at SMU. And that was that is truly amazing. I'm so glad to see that people are still protesting in the streets now, still demanding that changes be done. And many of them have concrete demands. They really have come up with a list of things they want at the municipal level for the city to do, for the police departments to do. And it's not just our city. It's going across different municipalities, too, because it affects different communities in different ways. The demands change sometimes based on the community need. So I'm so glad that we got to speak today. I will share this recording. Thank you all for joining us. Um, if there are any questions, please feel free to email us and we'll pass them on to you, Anja, and see if you can answer them for us. Um, I am doing my best to participate in community growing. I am battling a, a couple of nasty squirrels in my neighborhood who seem to view my tomato garden as their own salad bar at the moment. So uh, we're trying as best we can in, in East Dallas, but um, I, I think it's important that I experiment with my kids too and show them that healthy food isn't just what is on a supermarket shelf but it's what you produce and the right. labor behind that and the importance of being responsible for that and um yeah if you have any tips on how to get rid of these squirrels i'll take them <laughs> get rescue well, I love my squirrels, but... give them a list of demands i know i'm about to, to give them a list of demands <laughs> I will trade them acorns to make them stop. They love, I have a tomato plant they seem to love. They ignore the rosemary, don't touch the mint, but they love them some tomatoes. And they, mm. they leave them half eaten for me on the back deck as, as, a, as, a, as a token to say that it was juicy for them. <laughs> so Maybe you should plant them their own dedicated tomato plant. I know, I, I feel like I just need else. to... Just sacrifice this one, just please stop tracking this one. So that's a good idea. I might try that. So thank you all so relentless. much. <laughs> thank you so thank much you. for the opportunity. Thank you all so much. I enjoyed thank the you. conversation. Thank you, everyone, and we'll share this soon.